The state has enjoyed a decade of sustained and economic fiscal gains, exceeding projections year after year. The sales tax is a significant component of both the state's and municipalities' revenue picture. If sales tax revenues are driving the state's growth, then it's logical to assume sales tax collections are driving municipal growth as well. And if the state is experiencing unprecedented growth, then municipalities must be experiencing comparable growth. This graph seems to confirm this sentiment. The blue line illustrates the state's growth over the last two years. The red line illustrates municipal growth over this same period. You'll note the red line shows that on a percentage basis, municipalities have grown slightly more than the state. Many stop here, content that their belief that cities are experiencing the same type of growth in sales tax as the state. But if you stop here, you miss the real story. The state is a single entity and represented as a single line reflects the truth. However, there are 345 cities shown here as a single red line representing the collective. So this line reflects the average of 345 municipalities and is not indicative of any single city. When you allocate 345 cities into few categories, you can begin to see the effects of averaging 345 cities and how it alters the perceived reality. The state's growth is shown in red. The green line illustrates the growth of cities above 35,000 population. The blue line illustrates the growth of cities below 35,000. The yellow line at the top reflects the growth of cities within Davidson and Sevier counties alone. You can see that by digging just a little deeper into municipal growth, a different picture begins to come into focus. Here's a different look at the same data that demonstrates the error of a cursory, simplistic look at municipal growth. The state sales tax grew by 25.2% over the two years. The first column on the far left reflects the average growth in sales tax of all 345 cities, which is 26.2%. But you'll note that 68% of all cities experienced a growth rate below the state's growth. The second column illustrates the growth of just the cities in Davidson and Sevier counties, which saw sales tax revenues grow by 46.7% over the last two years. The third column shows the growth rate for the cities with populations above 35,000 was 22.7% or 2.5% less than the state. The fourth column on the far right shows the growth rate for cities with populations below 35,000, which is 20.2% or 5% less than the state's rate of growth. When averaged, the extraordinary growth of Davidson and Sevier counties pulls up the growth of all 345 municipalities to reflect an average municipal growth of 26.2%. Thus, the simplistic view that only considers two lines, one for cities and one for the state, masks the reality that about 7 out of 10 cities sales tax grew more slowly than the state. So now we know that most cities' rate of growth was less than the state's growth rate. Growth rates are informative and somewhat helpful for comparisons, but when comparing the state, a single entity, with 345 unique municipalities, growth rates have limitations. Even within the three categories of cities presented here, there are vast differences in populations, commercial and retail bases, and budgets. Growth rates don't account for these differences. So how do we level a field and arrive at a comparison that better accounts for these variables and more closely reflects reality? Well. Cities provide services. To do this, cities pay for things and invest in things. So a more relevant examination of growth involves a per capita analysis. A per capita analysis has two key benefits. First, it mitigates the significant variations in populations, bases, and budgets between the state and cities and among the separate category of cities, putting all on equal footing and allowing for an apples to apples comparison. Second, a per capita analysis converts percentages into dollars, which allows us to determine how the growth in sales tax collections has altered cities' purchasing power, which is what matters. What we really want to know is how much more a city can buy or invest as a result of the growth in sales tax. The state's growth rate of 25.2% translates into an increase of $366.25 per person while the monumental 46.7% growth rate of cities in Davidson and Sevier counties translates to an increase of just $160.62 per person, which is 56% less per person than the state. On a per capita basis, the 227 growth rate for cities above 35,000 translates into an additional 
$107.40 per person. And those below 35 saw purchasing power increase by just $93, or one quarter of the state's growth per person. Think back to the first graph that showed the two lines, one for cities and one for the state, and how the two lines ran parallel with the municipal lines slightly higher. This deeper analysis reveals a significant gap that exists between the increase in the state's purchasing power and the growth in municipal purchasing power as a result of the growth in sales tax collections over the last two years. The obvious question is why? Well, there are several reasons. First, there's the simple truth of capacity. Some cities have a more dynamic base and their communities are growing, which affords a greater capacity for growth in sales tax collections. If a city has a limited commercial or retail footprint and no ability to expand its existing base, meaningful growth will be challenging. But there are other factors affecting every city that are beyond a city's control because their origins are found in state law. These statutory factors include rate erosion. For starters, the state levies a 7% tax on all sales except food, while the maximum rate allowed for a city is two and three quarters percent. In addition, the municipal sales tax levy is subject to mandatory fees and reductions. As a result, the state general fund realizes $6.50 for every $100 purchase. Meanwhile, the maximum collections a city realizes on $100 in purchases is $1.35. So the state realizes 93% of its sales tax levy, while a city's general fund only realizes about half of its levy after fees and dedicated reductions. The single article cap is another factor created by the law that contributes to the gap. A primary benefit of the sales tax is its inflation fighting capacity. The sales tax is levied on the purchase price, so as the price of goods and services increases, collections increase, helping to keep pace with inflation. This example demonstrates the effects of the single article cap on municipalities. The purchaser of a new Honda in 1990 paid $782.25 in sales tax to the state and another $44 in local option sales tax. However, because of the mandated fees and compulsory allocation to education, the city in which the car was purchased received just $21.27 for the purchase. Now, if the exact car and model were purchased in 2022, the purchaser would have paid $1,828.40 in sales tax based on the 7% levy, plus another $44 as a result of the $1,600 single article cap on the local levy. This means the state would net $1,872.40 on this purchase. Meanwhile, the city in which the car was purchased in 2022 would have received the same $21.27 as it received in 1990. So over 32 years between these two purchases, the state realized a 139% increase in sales tax collected on the purchase. This increase allowed the state to remain ahead of inflation and improve its purchasing power. Even though the purchase price on a Honda Accord increased by $10,475 over 32 years, the city received the exact same amount of $21.27 of sales tax in 2022 as it did in 1990. Therefore, the inflation combating benefits of the sales tax that are fully enjoyed by the state are completely negated by the single article and city's loss of purchasing power is compounded with each passing year. We've established a gap in real growth and in purchasing power exists both between the state and municipalities and between the various categories of cities. And we now know that the rate erosion and the single article cap are two factors derived from legislative action that contribute to this gap. And we also know that this gap is going to continue to widen. And we know that the existence of this gap matters and that the widening of this gap has real consequences. Why? Because municipalities are the economic engines of the state, producing on average 80 to 90% of all sales tax collected by the state. This occurs because cities and towns are providing the services, amenities, and quality of life that attract residents and businesses. And because municipalities help to create the environment and conditions under which economic activity occurs and revenues are generated. The financial burden associated with keeping the engine humming and continuing to produce economic activity and generate sales tax revenues falls largely on municipal residents. Growth is a direct result of economic expansion, which depends upon deliberate investment. If a city is losing purchasing power, then a greater share of its revenues is required just to maintain existing services at the previous year's levels. Next, 
A city must account for any one-time cost as well as any unanticipated cost. Then, and only then, can a city consider funding the deliberate investments that increase capacity for economic expansion. A widening gap and loss of purchasing power chokes investment and the engine will begin to sputter. If the engine sputters, economic expansion slows and the sales tax revenues flowing to the state are curtailed. An ever-widening gap is not sustainable and risks increasing the tax burden borne by city residents. Municipal leaders across the state have joined in calling on the governor and the General Assembly to restore the historic sharing relationship altered by legislation in 2002 by allowing every municipality to share in 100% of the state sales tax collections designated for the state's general fund. If our state shared sales tax legislation had been in place over the last two years, an additional 133 municipalities would have eclipsed the state's rate of growth and enactment of our legislation would have resulted in increasing the per capita growth of every city and town by another $21.28 per resident. Clearly, restoring the sharing relationship has tangible benefits that will help to mitigate the gap, reduce the risk of sputtering, and help to lessen the burden borne by city residents. Certainly, the other factors identified, such as administrative fees and the single article cap, need to be addressed. But we have chosen to lead with state shared sales tax because every single city and town will benefit once enacted.